Welcome everyone. Thank you for attending our webinar. We're going to get started in just a few seconds. We're going to give the rest of the crowd a few seconds to join us. But we're going to go ahead and dive right in. I want to welcome you all and thank you for joining us today. Um, this is the final of our life, life Lessons webinars. My name is Barbara Thomas, and I'm with the Tippy College of Business. Now, today's webinar is specifically titled, Last but Not Least, Tax Considerations for Life's Milestones. This webinar is the last of the series, as I mentioned, and we're really proud of this series because it is designed to provide you with legal and financial insights and ideas for each stage of your life. But as it is with all of them, I wanna to reiterate to you that these webinars are to provide those ideas, but that we are not providing you with official legal or financial advice. After attending any of our webinars, we encourage you to discuss your issues with your own financial planner, or your lawyer. Now, before I jump in, I do want to thank several people for their help in this series. Lydia Fine and Kathy Zaharis joined me in brainstorming on topics. What started as an idea for one webinar quickly grew into a series. Our thanks to them, as well as to Kay Haggerty. Now, Kay approached me after watching that first Life Lessons webinar with the idea about discussing the tax implications at each stage of your life. Well, how could we say no? Of course. And lastly, to my colleague in the College of Law, Jill DeYoung, who provided numerous recommendations of Iowa Law alumni. In the end, this series included seven webinars featuring 23 different speakers, and it attracted almost 3,000 registrants. Now, as a reminder, all of our life, less, life Lessons webinars are recorded and they are shared on the college's YouTube channel and on our website. Feel free to share the links for these webinars with your friends and your family. Now, several days after our webinar, we will send an email to all those that registered with a link to the video. And today, during our webinar, you can submit your questions through the Q&A button at the bottom and we will do our best to answer as many of them as we can. And now to introduce our speaker. Our speaker today is Kay Haggerty, an Associate Professor of Practice in the Tibby College of Business's Department of Accounting. Kay is a Tibby alum, having received her BBA in accounting in 1980. After graduation, she joined RSM, formerly McLadry, in Cedar Rapids, where she spent her entire 35-year career. Kay was the first woman promoted to partner in the Cedar Rapids office mm -hmm. and the first woman and youngest person to serve on the firm's national board of directors. During her career, she served on the board of directors of numerous charitable and civic organizations. She retired in 2015, having provided tax services to both individual and business clients. Kay then turned around and joined the Tippy faculty in 2018, and she teaches two courses to accounting majors. She is especially proud to have received several honors and awards from the Tippy College, including the Collegiate Teaching Award, the Undergraduate Faculty of the Year Award, and the Innovation in Teaching Award. And with that, I will turn it over to Kay. Thank you, Barb, for that kind introduction. I'm really excited uh, to be here with you today because while this is titled, uh, last but not least, tax, and I tell my students that tax should always be on the list, it shouldn't always be first, but we need to not forget about it as well. We are mirroring each of the life lessons in the series to date. Uh, and I'll dive into some of the tax ramifications at each of those um, stages in life. Some of you listening are at the towards the end of the life cycle. Some of you are at the beginning. So the the topics um, and the points that I make might not specifically apply to you at this point in your life, but 
most of us who are at the end of the life cycle or approaching it maybe have younger people in our lives that we need to give advice to and mentor and vice versa. So bear with me if I'm talking about things that aren't particularly applicable to you and look for the tidbits that might be helpful to people in your life. So we'll start out with first steps. When you're just starting your career, your work, life, what things should you think about? And I think that from my experience in the classroom, a lot of my students have no idea the value of benefits provided by the employer and what those benefits might consist of. The first one I'll talk about is health and life insurance. The uh, tax law is very supportive of employers providing health insurance for their employees. Not every employer can afford to do that, but if they can, it's provided at a much lower cost because the risk is being spread over numerous lives. So uh, hopefully most uh, people have health insurance provided by their employer. You may not think about it, but when those premiums are paid on your behalf, they're not included in your taxable income. So a benefit right out, out of the gate. That also includes long-term care insurance. That's different than health insurance. Long-term care insurance would be for your later years when you might be in a care facility. People need to keep in mind that insurance doesn't cover every dollar. So if you have to pay part of the premiums because either your employer provides individual coverage but not family coverage, or they can split the, benef uh, the premium cost with you, any premiums that you pay out of pocket yourself go in a bucket that I call itemized deductions for medical expenses. And the other things I have on the screen are any other out-of-pocket expenses for co-pays, co-insurance, deductibles. All of that goes in a bucket. You can come up with a total. And unless you are seriously ill or don't have insurance, most people don't see a benefit from itemizing their medical expenses because you have to get off the floor. The floor is 7.5% of your adjusted gross income. So anything above the floor would be a deductible item. Anything, what I say in the basement, is lost forever. So let me give you an example. If your adjusted gross income is $100,000, your floor is $7,500. Any expenses below $7,500 are simply gone. If you get over the $7,500, Let's say you have 8,000 in medical expenses, then 500 would be a qualified deductible medical expense if you are itemizing. I want to do a quick caution for people who are self-employed. And this happens when we have partners or spouses. One spouse may be covered by their employer plan. Fabulous. It's great. The plan may also cover the spouse. If the spouse is self-employed. Hopefully they know or are aware that there is a deduction for uh, health insurance premiums paid by self-employed individuals. However, and this is where the caution comes in, if the spouse could have been covered under the employer plan provided to their spouse, then they are not entitled to the self-employed health insurance deduction. And it's if you are eligible, not whether you participate, it's if you are merely eligible you can no longer take the self-employed health insurance deduction. Another benefit on the insurance front is for group term life insurance. This is insurance that is provided across the board to all employees on a non-discriminatory basis. And the maximum that can be provided without having tax consequences when the premiums are paid is $50,000. Retirement plans, obviously a major benefit that uh, employees look for when they accept a position with an employer. Again, it may seem very obvious to some of you. I know my students had no concept that when the employer makes contributions into their retirement piggy bank, that contribution is tax deferred income. They're not paying taxes on it today. And likewise, if the employee puts their own money into the plan, they are able to defer taxes on anything that they put into the plan and all of the earnings that accumulate until the time that they're withdrawn. The magic in this is that in a lot of cases, 
your income will be lower in retirement than it is during your working years. So the retirement benefits, when you pull them out, will hopefully be subjected to a, a lower tax rate. Another very important point in retirement plans is that employers have an incentive or employees have an incentive to contribute to plans because their employer may say, if you put so much money into your retirement bucket, I, the employer, will match that. So it's a two for one. Possibly it's up to the employer to decide how much, but you get more bang for your buck if there's an employer match. We had some legislation late in 2022. The acronym is SECURE. It stands for Setting Up Every Community for Retirement Enhancement. This is a big deal. It was a bipartisan bill. I think it has nothing but goodies in it and clearly is really expanding the opportunities for people to save for retirement. Notice that I've got years behind each of the items that I'm going to highlight today. What that means is that some of these provisions are not in effect today. It may take a year or two, depending on the provision, for that to be available. In addition, they're not necessarily automatic. An employer would need to amend their plan to incorporate this new provision to allow employees to take advantage of it. The first one is that when employers do a match on a 401k plan, it usually goes into a generic 401k plan. Uh, the legislation is now going to allow plans to have the employer match go into a Roth 401k plan, meaning it would not be taxable um, when the uh, funds are withdrawn in retirement. In addition, we all know that student loans are a big deal right now. Students have a heavy burden of debt. In order to enable students to pay off their student loans and also save for retirement, as opposed to having to make a choice between one or the other, if students make payments on their loans, those are considered contributions to their plan for purposes of employer matching. The new uh, law has also set up the opportunity to accumulate emergency savings accounts and make withdrawals from those accounts. Uh, there, the devil's in the details on all of these provisions. So I'm, I'm just trying to alert you to have that on your radar screen and follow up as we approach 2024. We've had catch up contributions for individuals who are age 50, where the amount they can put into their plan starts to ramp up at a more rapid pace to allow them to maybe literally, as it says, catch up if they weren't able to contribute throughout their working years. Those contribution amounts are going to go up and be adjusted by inflation. And then finally, the federal government is going to give taxpayers a subsidy. There's something called the savers credit. So if you are, as a, a taxpayer, contributing to your own retirement, the government will actually give you a credit not a deduction, but a dollar for dollar credit against your tax liability. So again, a very big deal. And I wanna remind people, regardless of what you think about social security, its viability, is it fair, all of those kinds of things, I think it's important for people starting out in their career to realize that every paycheck they get, 7.65% of their compensation is going into their social security bucket with their name on it, but the employer is required to match 7.65%. So it truly is a benefit and I think it's often overlooked. Cafeteria plans, there's a lot of lingo when we talk about these. Basically they are options that employers can provide to their employees where they say, we'll give you so much cash. And if you take the cash, we're done. You have taxable income and life goes on, but you could choose to spend the allocation that you get on different kinds of benefits and you can buy them on a pre-tax basis, meaning that you're going to have tax savings for every dollar that you put in. Cafeteria plans are the broad umbrella and underneath those are subcategories and I've got them listed here and I'll talk about each one individually. The flexible spending account, again, is often used interchangeably in terms of the verbiage. This is the account where you choose how much money you want to put into it for the things that I have listed there. Health insurance, out-of-pocket medical, daycare, adoption. You need to be very careful when you make your decision of how much you're going to set aside because if you don't use it by the end of the calendar year, it's gone, which is why we say use it or lose it. 
So don't put more in than you think you're going to take advantage of and make sure you keep track of it as the year end approaches and maybe do elective surgery, um, go in and have your teeth cleaned, have your um, annual physical, whatever it is that you can do to spend that money. A health savings account can be provided within a cafeteria plan, but individuals can also do their own health savings accounts. This is if you've chosen or are covered by medical insurance that has very high deductibles so that you're paying more until you're in the money with the insurance coverage. You're allowed to set aside money on a pre-tax basis so that when you're paying out of pocket until you hit the deductible amount, you can tap into that account that you've been accumulating to cover some of your costs. Disability insurance can also be provided within the cafeteria plan setting. Very, very, very important thing to keep in mind, and I'm not sure how many people uh, realize this. If the employer pays the premiums for disability, you may say, great, I don't have to pay for that myself. However, if you're unfortunate enough to become disabled and you get $50,000 to replace your lost earnings when you become disabled, because the employer paid the premium, the $50,000 incoming will be taxable income. On the other hand, if you pay the premiums yourself or pay them with after-tax dollars within the employer plan, then when that $50,000 comes in the door when you're disabled, it is completely tax-free. In my mind, it's a no-brainer. The cost of disability insurance, yeah, uh, it's a good thing to, to pay that year after year to protect taxability of the, of the benefits if you are unfortunate enough to have to get them, but fortunate enough to have a plan to replace your earnings. And then group term life insurance I talked about previously, it can also be included within a cafeteria plan. Assistance plans. These are employer paid benefits that simply come to employees tax-free. And the two biggies are employers can give each employee $5,000 to defray their um, daycare costs. In addition, they can provide educational assistance programs. And right now the amount they can provide tax-free is $5,250. This also includes student loan payments. So the $5,250 could be used to pay student debt principal, interest, whatever, whatever um, is happening in the repayment plan. This can be for an employee to go back to school for undergraduate programs or graduate programs. One of the caveats, though, is that it, it be, um, while it doesn't need to be job related, if the course you're taking involves sports, hobbies, games, the things that could have an element of fun or recreation in them, those are not qualified educational expenses unless you're in one of those industries and you have to go to school to learn more about those particular items within your industry. Okay, so you've got your feet under you, you've got your job, you're on your way. Perhaps the next thing coming along is that you will find a partner to spend the rest of your life with. Now we're talking about whether you are going to file a joint return or file separately. And I'd like to walk you through why filing status is the first thing you have to think about and it drives everything else. So I will show you in a minute a tax rate schedule, not to bore with a bunch of numbers, but I wanna at least give you a, a glimpse of how to look at the tax rate schedules. Depending on your filing status, you may not pay the highest level of tax at the fastest rate, depending on your filing status. In addition, if you don't itemize deductions, you get what I call a free coupon. You get a standard deduction, even if you don't have enough itemized. That amount is also driven by your filing status. Tax credits, these are dollar for dollar offsets against your liability. And again, they're based on your filing status, along with a lot of other criteria, like your level of adjusted gross income, so forth. So what's my filing status? First question is, what is my marital status? And then you also need to know if you have dependents. And I'm not going to go into the details on dependents. That could take a whole hour. The thing I want most people to take away uh, today as a learning, if you didn't know it before, is that when we uh, had the uh, tax bill in 2017, uh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, I'll refer to it uh, some more later in the slides, 
there were some give ups in addition to the things the law gave us as benefits. And one of them is for the years 2018 through 2025, if you have a dependent, they meet the definition, you are no longer getting a deduction for the dependent or for yourself, a deduction called the personal exemption amount. That's on, on hold unless Congress changes it. It's gone until 2025. It may come back in 2026, again, depending on what Congress does. Let me give you an example of the impact of losing the dependency deduction and the personal exemption. No, I'm gonna skip a couple slides here so I can finish that off for you. If in my example, you had two parents and one child, each of those human beings are worth approximately $4,000 a piece in deductions. Again, right now that is gone. So if you look at the table that I've got up in front of you here, this is the standard deduction amount. And if we look at married filing joint, the first line, you can see that before the tax law change in 2017, the standard deduction, the coupon amount was $13,000. Knowing that the personal and dependency exemptions were taken away, in my example, 12,000, you can see for that married couple, their standard deduction almost covered the loss in those um, deductions. It didn't necessarily help if you had two kids, three kids. I had a client who had six kids and they took it in the shorts, but that is how Congress tried to balance things out. Another thing about the standard deduction increasing is that itemized deductions are a place where a lot of taxpayers take, I'll call them liberties with deductions. You have to keep a lot of records to prove your deductions. The IRS has to come in and examine them. It's tedious on both sides. So Congress thought by raising the standard deduction, fewer people would itemize and there would be less record keeping on the taxpayer side and the IRS side. Now let me jump back and let's talk about filing status options. So if you're married on the last day of the year, you're married. You can file a joint or the option we have at the bottom, you can do married filing separately, meaning that each uh, partner spouse files their own tax return. There's a benefit if you lose your spouse during the year, you're considered married for the entire year, even if you're not considered married on December 31st. So you get the benefit of the married filing joint rates. In addition, if you lose your spouse for the next two years, if you don't remarry and you have a dependent child, it's very specific, you can continue to use the same rates as if you were still married filing jointly. And that's again for two years after the year of death. Head of household is for people who are unmarried on the last day of the year, but they might not be responsible for just themselves. They might maintain the household for a qualified person. I'm underlining these definitions because they are different and you need to make sure you meet um, the specific definition. But if you're a single person, whether you've never been married or you are now divorced and you have household responsibilities for a child, then you don't get rates that are as favorable as married filing joint, but you also don't get rates that are as um, unfavorable as if you were single. Single, you're married, excuse me, you're not married on the last day of the year. And again, think about, can I sneak up into that head of household uh, status? Married filing separately, I'll talk some more about why you would or would not be interested in doing that. So here are the tax rate schedules. And I just wanna show you very briefly here that if you look at the single column, the 22% rate bracket starts at 89,000, or excuse me, ends at 89,000. $75. Go over to the head of household, ends at the same place for the most part, $89,050. But if you back up, you can see that the 22% rate for a single person starts at almost $42,000, whereas a head of household can have income all the way up to $56,000 um, before they hit that 22% tax bracket. So there's some savings in those lower rate brackets. Again, for people who are not married, but have a child in their household. The arrow that I have on the bottom of the slide shows you that a single person, if they're lucky enough to have $540,000 of taxable income, they're gonna jump into the highest rate bracket of 37%. On the other hand, married filing joint taxpayers, 
could wait until 600 and almost 50,000 of taxable income before that hit that highest bracket. These are the rates for capital gains and qualified dividends, the preferential rates. And again, I just wanna draw your attention to the distinction between whether you're a single taxpayer or head of household, and you can study those numbers some more on your own. We talked about the standard deduction. So let's talk about the non-tax considerations. Again, tax is very important, but there are a lot of non-tax reasons to choose your filing status. Overall, married filing separately doesn't provide tax advantages. If you look back at those tables, the uh, married filing separate numbers are exactly one half of the married filing joint. However, remember that I talked about the 7.5% AGI floor that you have to get over before you can deduct medical expenses. If you had the situation where one spouse had been critically ill, had significant medical costs during the year that were uninsured, it might be to the a benefit of the married couple to marry, do married filing separately so that in theory, the AGI limit for the spouse who is ill would be a lower number and you'd get into the money, you'd get above the floor sooner. Married filing separate has a lot more uh, beneficial reasons from a non-tax perspective. We talked uh, in the other life lessons webinars about you could maybe love the person that you are sharing your life with, but you don't love their financial choices or situation, know that when you do a married filing joint return, you, each individual, are responsible for any liabilities in connection with that return. So if you have a spouse who I call a spendthrift, they spend money like water. You have a spouse that has significant debt that you are not um, a co-signer on or they have had a history of bankruptcy, you might want to say, thank you very much. I'm gonna file my own return. There are also some provisions. I had a, a really good friend who loved her spouse, but he had so many business issues going on that she chose to do married filing separate just so she didn't get tangled up in all of that. If she had filed a joint return, she may not have been aware of all the things going on in that return. That's no excuse. Innocent spouse does not mean ignorant spouse. But if she had reasonable basis for not knowing about certain things that were in the return, there are some rules that will provide some leniency to the innocent spouse so they're not stuck holding the bag. Other reasons to do married filing separately are if you are bringing uh, individual wealth to the marriage, if it's a second marriage and you have children, by your first marriage, you may want to keep things separate. Want to make it clear though that if you have a prenuptial for non-tax reasons or even some tax reasons, you are not required to do married filing separately. That is not a requirement to if you have a prenuptial. So don't think that one um, is mutually exclusive to the other. And then I just want to alert you that while I'm talking mostly about federal rules, Every state has their own rules regarding common law marriage, um, same-sex marriage, so you need to pay attention to those rules as well. Divorce, the unhappy ending to a romantic situation. You need to know what could happen at that point. I always say three things happen when married people get divorced. They divide up the stuff, property settlement, who gets what. Even though these two individuals may not like each other anymore, the act of transferring assets from one spouse to another in a property settlement is considered a gift for tax purposes. Gifts are not income to the recipient. They're not a deduction to the person who's making the gift. That's the first issue. The second issue is child support. If you have ch uh, children in the marriage, you need to decide who's gonna pay who what, but remember, child support is not taxable to the recipient, not deductible to the payer. And then finally, alimony. There was a significant change in the law, again, with that 2017 tax bill. If you were divorced, your decree was signed before January 1st of 2019, life will go on as it's always been. If you receive alimony, it's taxable. If you pay alimony, it's deductible. However, if you 
signed a divorce decree after January 1st of 2019, it will never be taxable if received, never deductible if paid. So you might say, well, if everything evened out before the law change, income equal deduction, maybe not necessarily because you don't know who was getting a deduction at maybe a higher bracket than the person who was picking up the income at a lower bracket. There were also some problems with one person taking the deduction and the other person forgetting, forgetting uh, to pick up the income. So they've just clarified all of that. Finally, if you do have dependents, they're usually claimed by the custodial parent, but there is, and I've got the form referenced for you there, form 8332, which says, gee, the kid or kids are living with one parent, but having the dependent would be more advantageous to the other parent. And if you're still playing nicely enough to want to save taxes for everybody in the now separate family, formerly a combined family, it may be to your advantage to be open to sharing the dependent deduction when we have it, or certainly the, um, the uh, dependent for purposes of establishing filing status. Okay, so you've got your first job, you're maybe in a, a committed relationship, or even if you're not, you are transitioning to, I wanna own my own house, I wanna start a family. What's involved there? Home ownership. The tax law has a lot of benefits for home ownership. The first one is that if you have a mortgage, you can deduct the interest expense as an itemized deduction. There are some rules though. A lot of people don't know you can deduct the interest on your primary home and a second home, not a home where you're generating income like a rental property, but your vacation home or your home in Italy, uh, if you're lucky enough to have that. The debt has to be secured by the residents, and there are all kinds of, of terms, acquisition debt, home equity loan, home equity line of credit, second mortgage. Under current law, again, we're in kind of a window here, it has to be debt incurred in connection with acquiring uh, the home. So you can't borrow against the equity in your home and pay for education or go on a vacation or pay for a wedding that debt under current law would not be deductible. There's also a cap on the amount of mortgage debt service that can be deducted. At this point, it's $750,000. That doesn't mean you can't buy a house for a million dollars. What it means is that only three quarters of the interest expense you're paying would be an allowable deduction. After 2025, again, when the uh, sunset provisions on the 2017 Act occur or Congress doesn't change it, then the rules were back to where you could have a million dollars of acquisition indebtedness plus 100,000 of true home equity where uh, debt where you borrow against your equity in the house and you do something unrelated to the house with the money. In addition for home ownership, if you have property taxes um, where you live, your property taxes are um, an eligible deduction. And I use that word eligible because you have to look at all the taxes in your life, property taxes, income taxes, car licenses, if they qualify, all of that, add up your bucket. And no matter who you are, unless you're married filing separate, you hit a limit of $10,000. This is actually advantageous because a married couple would get 10,000, a single person gets 10, head of household gets 10. I personally think that was a mistake when they drafted the law. Nevertheless, you only have 5,000 limit if you're married filing separately. It may be clear to a lot of people on the call, but again, people who are newbies at this, utilities, maintenance, insurance, none of those expenses qualify as deductions for tax purposes. In addition, if you are unfortunate enough to have a casualty in connection with your home, prior to the 2017 tax law change, if insurance didn't cover uh, getting your house back to the way it was or getting all of your belongings back, um, you could take a deduction for what you were uh, left with, your loss, as an itemized deduction. In this window of time we're living in between 2018 and 2025, you can only deduct casualty losses if you are in a presidentially declared federal disaster area. So the example I give my students is if a tornado comes and touches down on top of your house, 
and everyone else is fine, you're out of luck. But if the derecho comes through and the president declares a disaster area, now you are in the game again in terms of a casualty loss deduction. The other really big benefit for home ownership, this only applies to your principal home, not your second home, is that if you sell your home and are lucky enough to come out $500,000 ahead of what you bought the house for, you can exclude that. You can ignore that amount of gain up to 500,000. It's 250 if you're a single person. And the other Benny is that a house is a capital asset, your principal resident. So if you do have gain above 500,000, most likely you'll get capital gains preferential rates for that amount. Raising your family. Again, I've talked about the fact that you don't get a deduction for your children or yourself. Know though that there are some other benefits in the law that help you with raising your family. Uh, there's a benefit in an employer assistance program of up to 15,950 of ex uh, expenses being covered that would not be taxable income. Or if your employer doesn't provide that for you, you can accumulate those expenses and there's a credit that could be available. There's a credit if you have children under age 17, 2,000 for each qualifying child. And again, in this window of time, if you have other dependents who are not your children, you can add another $500. In 2023, and then this benefit goes away, you can also get an additional child tax credit of 1,600 and you can actually get a refund for that amount. And then finally, if you have to have daycare expenses to be gainfully employed, then if you have children under 13, you can consider up to $1,050 of expenses and get a daycare child, um, credit. Again, you have to have the daycare expense so that it allows you to be gainfully employed. Education, big ticket item. I mentioned earlier that perhaps your employer will provide free educational assistance. Know that that only applies to the employee. It cannot be used for family members of the employee. A lot of students are lucky enough to get scholarships. When you look at whether someone is your dependent, you have to determine how much support they're providing or you are providing. You can ignore scholarships in your calculation of the amount of support. In addition, if your student uh, is lucky enough to get a full ride, know that that only excludes from income tuition, books, fees, expenses, and so forth. Room and board, you got to eat anyway. If that's covered, it's going to be taxable income. There are different kinds of savings plans. They all have different requirements, so I've just got them up there for you in name only. Education savings accounts, sometimes they're called education IRAs, sometimes they're called Coverdale accounts. That was the member of Congress who introduced the bill to provide for these. 529 plans. Those are state plans, and I'm going to talk about those in more detail in another slide. A lot of people don't know that if you invest in U.S. savings bonds, that might not be the best investment choice. But if you do, if you cash them in and spend the money on qualified education, they're tax free. Student loans, if you are borrowing to pay for college, um, there is an interest expense deduction of up to $2,500. Um, a lot of rules in terms of how much income you have and so forth. So you have to watch those tests, but don't forget it's there. In addition, there's a lot of talk right now, um, primarily President Biden wanting to forgive student debt. We already have some provisions on the books regarding debt forgiveness. So again, think about those when you are looking at your student situations. You have limits on how much you can give to a child in a year. I'll talk about that later. Know that the limit that you have each year does not have to consider any payments you make for education where the check goes directly to the educational institution as opposed to being paid to the child and then submitted to the institution. And then finally, there are two different credits. American Opportunity is for the first four years of secondary education and lifetime learning is if you are incurring educational expenses beyond the first four years of college. 
I've got a chart up here with the differences between Section 529 plans and simply making gifts to a minor child. I'll use that as the example. It used to be the uniform gifts to minors. Now it's called the uniform gifts, or excuse me, uniform transfers to minors. Either way, I've got these on a side-by-side -side on this chart. 529s get tax preferential treatment. Um, you can, depending on the state you're in, maybe get a tax deduction or a credit, and the earnings are tax-free as they grow. The withdrawals are tax-free if they're spent for qualified education expenses. If you have more than one child and you put money into a 529 plan, the first child doesn't use all the money, you can pass it down all the way through to until all of your children have gotten through school. In terms of FAFSA, um, student loan funding, all those awful applications that have to be filled out, any money in a 529 plan is not considered owned by the child. So it may help with student loan financing. Keep in mind that the states individually manage what you can choose to invest in. And they also tend to have these racked up so that they're age-based. Um, you can use them for K through 12 education up to $10,000. Very quickly on the other side, know that if you are simply putting money into an account for a child, uh, the child would own the property for FAFSA purposes, even though the parent is actually the custodian until the child reaches the age of majority. But know that there are tax consequences, unlike with the 529 plans, and that is that as the earnings accumulate, they could be subjected to tax and that darn kitty tax which I don't have time to go into, basically tax what is the kid's earnings at the parent's higher rate. Gifts to minors are subject to the uh, 17,000 uh, limit per child, per person, per year. But making these direct transfers might be an alternative for families that have limited assets that don't want to worry about trust funds and all of the complexities of doing estate planning. Another concern, though, is if you transfer money to a specific child, it's theirs. You can't keep passing it down the line to the rest of the kids in your family to provide for their education. Financial protection. Previous speakers in the series um, have talked about documents that you should have, things that you should have in place. I am not an attorney. I cannot do um, preparation of documents. But know that there are trust situations if you have, again, what I call spendthrift children who would waste money if you gave it to them outright, or if you have special needs children, people who are going to be dependent for the rest of their lives, what can you do to protect them once you are gone? Financial protection includes disability that we've previously talked about. If you become disabled and can no longer work, insurance will kick in to help you pay the groceries. Life insurance, if you should die, it provides some protection to your children. Again, keep in mind that life insurance proceeds are not taxable when they're received. On the flip side though, the life insurance premiums don't qualify as a deduction for medical expenses. And then don't forget the employer $50,000 group term option. Long-term care I've talked about, Remember that here it's different. You can potentially get a deduction for medical expense treatment, but there's a, a limit based on your age. Documents, documents, documents. I've already kind of uh, alluded to that. I'm not an attorney, but I think everyone should consider having a financial power of attorney, certainly a will and trust documents if they apply. Know that the way these documents are written can have income tax consequences for those who are still alive and estate and gift tax consequences for the person who has passed away. I strongly consider um, a survivor's notebook. If you Google survivor's notebook, you'll get all kinds of examples. This is where you should have all these documents. So when the tragedy happens that you lose a loved one, you remember, go grab the notebook off the shelf and all the things you need to know in that first few moments, days, months, maybe even year of grief, that's where you go to find all, all of the documents. You don't have to be searching all over the place. Titling is very important. If you have an account that has 
uh, individual's name on it, that um, will probably follow whatever the will provisions are. If the will says my assets go here, here, and here, those accounts will be covered. But if you have an account that has uh, joint tenants with rights of survivorship, it's commonly used by mar uh, married couples or people that have simple estates, because what happens is when one account owner dies, it just automatically transfers to the own other owner without having to do anything. But because it is an automatic transfer, if your will said, I want all of my accounts to be allocated to whoever I mention in my will, the accounts that have rights of survivorship will transfer and the will provisions will be ignored. Um, a lot of times we consider adding a child to an account for aging parents to help them write bills. Be really careful with how you title this. I'm a CPA, I do this, did this for a living. And my mom said, I want to put you on my account so you can pay some of my bills. We went to the bank, we did that. I did not realize that she had just made essentially a gift to me of half of the account and that when she died, that was my money. And my sister, my only sibling, would have no right to share in it. I did what I needed to do to make it all work out. But you need to be really aware of that. And I'll talk about some more details on the next slide. Finally, if you have an asset that passes with rights of survivorship, you will lose the right to step up the basis in the asset that we're talking about, meaning any appreciation that has occurred during the, the deceased person's lifetime will be taxed at some point as opposed to being um, ignored under the estate tax rules. Convenience accounts. This is the term that you want to have in your mind if you have a situation like I did where your mom wants to have you help write checks. Every state, excuse me, about half of the states have adopted what's called the Uniform Multiple Person Accounts Act. And it is where, in essence, you have a financial power of attorney over an account. Your parent hasn't transferred the money to you. You have no rights of survivorship. Uh, you simply have the ability to write checks to help your parent so they don't have to worry about some of the details. Beneficiary designations. We've talked about life insurance, retirement plans, annuities are another retirement vehicle know that you are going to be required to designate a beneficiary, the person or persons who will get the assets in the account when you die. That will also override whatever provisions you have in your will. On the other hand, if you have what I call after-tax assets, investments or property outside of these tax deferred accounts, those will follow the provisions of the will, again, if they're properly titled. You made it to golden retirement. What things do you need to think about? Medical expenses, again, in your older years, I know I'm feeling the aches and pains. I go to the doctor more. When I retired early from my employer, I was 57 years old. I didn't qualify for Medicare. I paid my own health insurance premiums. That's when you realize what a benefit you got from your employer all those years. When you are on Medicare and you get your social security statement at the end of the year, it will show how much has been deducted from your payments for Medicare parts B and D. Those also qualify as deductible medical expenses, again, assuming you get over the floor. Long-term care insurance we've talked about as well as long-term care insurance. But what I'm talking about in this fourth bullet is that if you go to a care facility and you start out in independent living, but you gradually move through the various phases, assisted living, maybe you end up in nursing care. You are paying for room and board at that care facility, but you're also paying for medical expenses. You want to get the information about what portion of your monthly fee is for medical, because you can put that in your medical expense bucket. And for a lot of people, their AGI will be lower in retirement and they'll have a better chance of having deductible medical expenses. There is a provision that a lot of people don't know about and that lets you have a one-time tax-free transfer of money out of your IRA, which would otherwise be taxable, and you can put it into an HSA account. 
there's a limit, which I have for a family situation. You also have to um, be eligible, SHA, health savings account eligible for the next 12 months. And there's some other nitty details. Be careful that you are paying attention to those so you don't end up in a penalty situation. Social security, people are often confused that there are three different things that happen when you're in retirement mode. If you continue working and you're receiving social security, if you make too much, and I've got those numbers on the screen, your social security benefits will be reduced. You won't receive as much. When you finally reach full retirement age, you don't have to worry about how much you make in your second career, such as, as I have in my own situation, although I'm not on social security yet. Um, if you are continuing to work, you still have to pay into the social security piggy bank in your name and your employer will match. And then finally, when you're receiving social security benefits, if your income is high enough and it's based on your adjusted gross income and there's a formula, then your social security benefits won't be tax free. Up to 85% of the benefits could end up being taxable. So even though you paid in, when you get it back out, you may have the privilege opportunity to pay taxes. Understand it's not an 85% tax rate, it's up to 85% of the benefits go in your taxable income bucket. Retirement plan distributions. Most people know that at some point you have to start taking the money out. You can't tax defer it forever. This is an area where there are a lot of questions and they are so specific to the individual situation that I am afraid I can provide the general rules, but there are some new rules that I want you to be aware of. Again, provided by the law that was passed in late 22. Required age um, to take out minimum distributions is now 73, used to be 70 and a half. And by 2023, it'll be 2033, it'll be up to age 75. If your employer chooses to, uh, there will be the ability to have Roth IRA accounts in employer retirement plans, and they wouldn't have minimum distribution requirements. In 2022, we already have the ability to take out distributions tax-free in situations where the taxpayer is terminally ill. And then finally, a new provision um, is that you can take 529 plans. So you saved an estate plan for your first kid, second, third, whatever number of children, and you get to the end of the educational line and you still have money in that account. If you take it out, it's taxable. If you take it out for educational expenses, it's not. This provision says you can roll over up to $35,000 that's left over in your 529 plan and put it into a Roth. In my opinion, that's a big deal. And then don't forget, if you are charitably inclined, once you hit age 70 and a half, you can take money in retirement plans that if it was distributed to you would be taxable and have it bypass you. It will go directly to the charity. So you avoid all the limits and problems that could occur by having it jump into your taxable income and then have to qualify for deductions on your itemized deductions. State residency, a lot of people say, I'm getting the hell out of the taxable state that I'm living in. Be very careful. Every state has different provisions about taxing social security and retirement plan benefits. A lot of you have maybe heard that you have to live in the state you want to transfer to for at least 183 days or more than half of the year. I talked about the $500,000 exclusion on the sale of your principal residence. If you do all of the things I have listed on the slide to say, I'm no longer an Iowa resident, I now live in Florida, but you are keeping your home in Iowa because you come back when it's too hot to be in Florida, you may not get the $500,000 gain exclusion on the house you have in Iowa because it's no longer your primary residence. So be very careful that you've weighed the options. You hit the end of the line, a lot of things to be concerned about when you die. Again, financial protection. You may in your final um, months of being alive have disability insurance. 
You may have provided for your beneficiaries with life insurance, long-term care insurance. I'm an advocate to consider self-insuring. I know a lot of people who invested in long-term care insurance over the years, and maybe it was the plan that they chose to buy, but they didn't get a lot of bang for the buck when the time came. You should also know that life insurance distributions can be accelerated if you have a terminally ill situation. Again, the uh, new 2022 law change um, provided for the distributions for terminally ill. And then if you have a lot of uninsured medical expenses, keep in mind that you can choose to deduct those on the decedent's last individual income tax return, or they can be claimed to offset the estate taxable, um, excuse me, the taxable amount of your estate when you die for estate tax purposes. Funeral expenses, they aren't medical expenses. A lot of people get confused about that. They are a deduction on the estate tax return. So if you have a ta estate tax exposure, bundle all of those expenses up and keep track of them. Life insurance, again, not taxable to the recipient, the beneficiary, but for estate tax purposes, you have to consider the life insurance on your life. Some people think there's still uh, the ability for an employer to give an, a, the grieving family of an employee $5,000 tax-free. That has been gone since 1996. Federal estate and gift taxes, very complicated situation. They're paid by the donor, the decedent. Even if they're uh, in connection with gifts while you're still alive. It's the recipient of a gift, an inheritance or life insurance proceeds that can avoid income taxation. In the 2017 Tax Act, they doubled the exemption amount so that if you had a taxable estate of 5.6 million, it was bumped up to 11.2. And if you were married, the married couple got between them 22.4 million. That eliminated most people from having an estate tax situation, but we're subject to this window again where if Congress doesn't change the law, we're gonna go back to where we were pre-2018 and the estate tax exemption per person will be adjusted for inflation closer to 6 million than what it is right now, which is almost 13 million. So, I've jabbered a lot, Barb. Do we have time for some questions before we say goodbye to our listeners? We do. So I'll just throw a couple to you that I think are quick answers, okay? Okay. Um, property tax. If I pay, um, if the property tax, uh, if in 22 is paid in 2023, 20, is it deductible in 22 or in 23? It's deductible by an individual when it's paid. We as individual human beings are on the cash basis. So even though you have the liability at the end of 22, you got to write the darn check before you can deduct it. And the last one again, um, can you use 529 funds for summer camps for your children? Hmm. I... I don't know the answer to that. And I hate it when I have to say that, except that that's a good question. And, and I could certainly find an answer for whoever was interested in knowing that. Well, again, Kay, our thanks to you. As you can all see, Kay's contact information is here. And then Kay, I believe that you are willing to share your slides with us as a handout. Is that Abs true? So Absolutely. That's why I've got them full of so much detail. So it can be a quick reference to start everyone out. Excellent. So please watch for that email that you will get. It will have a link to this video, but in addition, it will have a link to the slides that will be on the Life Lessons webinar um, webpage. So um, again, I want to thank Kay for her help with this webinar. I know it took a lot of time. We're really grateful for everything you put into it. Um, in addition, we want to let you know that after this webinar, you will receive a short survey. We appreciate you taking the time to fill that out. Let us know how we did. Let us know what else you'd like to learn about. And on behalf of the Tippy College of Business, we want to thank you all for being with us. And as always, go Hawks. Bye-bye. <laughs>